Discover your inner goddess and live up to your highest value and most abundant potential. Welcome to Grateful Goddesses, a podcast that empowers you to unleash your inner goddess and take the leap of faith to live your best life. Your guide, Karen Pulver, joins her fellow goddesses in soulful conversations about gratitude, personal growth, authentic living, and a bevy of topics affecting women today. Let's start the show with your host, Karen Pulver. Thank you everyone for joining us today on Grateful Goddesses. Whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify or another streaming device, or reading the blog on gratefulgoddesses.com, we are so glad that you're joining us. So it's been a while that Grateful Goddesses has been out and airing, and we hope that you're enjoying your journey of learning and discovering new things. It's so important to remember to how to tap into your inner goddess. So there's various ways of doing that, right? There's watching and listening and reading the show and learning from our various guests that are joining us. And then there's looking inside and taking that inner goddess, all of those qualities out, being inspired by our guests, and then taking actionable steps to do something, to move forward. So our guest today is going to help us talk to talk to us about those actionable steps of how to tap into your inner mensch. What is a mensch? We're going to talk about that. So some of the techniques that she talks about specifically are really getting to know who you are, thinking about your inner mensch. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And then shifting those weaknesses to make them to be more positive and things that you can actually do to help yourself to really love and care about who you are. Because if you can't love yourself, how are you going to attract others to like and love you? In addition, I love this, the eggshell plan. And this is something at Grateful Goddesses that we often talk about, trying out new things, kind of like walking on eggshells. So it may not be comfortable. It may not you know, feel so safe, but it's actually so much fun to try new things. It's scary and sometimes can feel uncomfortable, but it's so enriching. And when you get yourself out there trying new things, you'll meet people. That's how you connect. So our guest today is Robin Gorman Newman. Robin Gorman Newman is the author of How to Meet a Mensch in New York and How to Marry a Mensch a decent, responsible person. As the founder of lovecoach.com, she's been seen on CNN and the Today Show and has lectured extensively, including Canyon Ranch and Mohonk Mountain House. She is also the founder of motherhoodlater.com, a worldwide organization for women who became a mom over 35, featured in the magazine USA Today and US News and World Report. An avid theater lover, she is a Tony-nominated Broadway producer of Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 that starred Josh Groban and is currently developing with her producing partner a musical inspired by her books. She is one of the co-hosts of Three Women Present, a new webinar series featuring inspiring speakers for women over 40. Robin is the mom to a 17-year-old son who is a volunteer firefighter, and they live in Great Nick with her mensch husband. Thank you, Robin, for joining us on Grateful Goddesses. Welcome. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy you're here, and I love your cover, your book in the background, How to Marry a Mensch. So, Robin, you wear so many hats, and you're involved in so many creative and innovative initiatives. Can you share with our listeners and viewers what those are and what motivated you to do what you're doing today? Sure. I always try to follow my heart, essentially, and if I'm launching something new, And if if it's coming out of need, which I feel like new things always do, I recognize that I'm not alone. And because needs are so often shared and it takes a village in so many circumstances. So that led me to create one of my current endeavors, which is motherhoodlater.com. And it's a worldwide organization for those who became a mom over 35, which is me. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but that's one of my hats. I also work as a love coach for singles, and I authored two books, How to Meet a Mensch in New York and How to Marry a Mensch, 
that also came out of need because I was trying to meet somebody and I felt like it would have been so helpful if I had some kind of a book. And this was, of course, pre, you know, pre-COVID, pre on the cusp of web. So, and when I say a book, kind of a zaggedy sort of guide to help me assess actually where to go and what to do, not strictly advice. And then I'm also a longtime theater lover. And in the last decade, I became actually a Tony-nominated Broadway producer. And I'm having the best time with that. That's amazing. You really, I can see that. You really do take all of the things that are affecting you in your life and apply it to helping others. And I really want to hear so much, too, about your passion with theater. We're going to invite our featured goddesses on to join us now. Hello. So, uh, Alyssa, you can start. Hi, Robin. It's so nice to meet you. Same here. I, um, you just mentioned that your, um, your books were born out of your own um, need and, and desire to have some kind of a guide in your own life. But can you talk a little bit more about what inspired you to actually sit down and write them? Sure. My first book was How to Meet a Mensch in New York, and the second is How to Marry a Mensch, which is, in fact, the book cover that you see back there. And How to Meet a Mensch in New York was born, essentially, because I felt for so long like I was the go-to person in my circle. I was always very resourceful. I was always kind of figuring out, oh, yeah, Friday night, we should go here. Thursday night, we should go there. And it got to be exhausting after a while, not just for me, but for all my friends tapping into my ideas, which I loved, but I I certainly never planned to be a formal resource, but I always wanted to write a book. And I started keeping a notebook and I was commuting back and forth to New York City and just jotting down vague ideas, whatever they were when they came to me. And one day I looked in that notebook and I was like, oh my gosh, there's a book in here. And that book was How to Meet a Mensch in New York. And that was when it hit me that it would be so helpful if there was some sort of zaggedy type guide that could point people in different directions, hopefully open their minds. The book is categorized, so it has things like nonprofit, travel, singles events, um, you know, all kinds of not just obvious things, but I, I dug deep into it to really give people a chance to think out of the box. A little bit because I think we all it's so easy to get stuck and you do what you know and you do what's familiar and that doesn't mean it's the right thing for you anymore and it might not be working and then your book how to marry a mensch I would assume took sort of all those ideas and sort of made them more global right I mean what it's it's different how to meet somebody in New York as it is to meet somebody in rural America right so I would think that that was the inspiration for your second book Yeah, what happened was I was doing a lot of speaking gigs and I actually got a lot of press coverage, which was crazy for me because I was on CNN and the Today Show for a local book. And it got huge press in London. And that was quite fascinating because it was, mensch is such a unique word and it's, and I didn't choose it lightly. And I know we're going to talk a little more about that, but it's a word that doesn't translate everywhere necessarily. And if you know it, you love it. If you don't know it, there's an intrigue around it. And for some reason, the Brits really embraced it. It was fascinating to me. But to your point, it became sort of, you know, futile in a way because my first book was only sold in the tri-state area. And then I started giving advice, actually, at the suggestion of a friend of mine. She said, you know, why don't you just work one-on-one with people? And that's when I branded myself as a love coach. So from that and the advice I started giving to people and through my lectures and then through the press, I said, you know, it's time for another book and it's time for a book that isn't limited regionally. And that's where How to Marry a Mensch was born. Okay, so I'm a native of the tri-state area myself, and you don't grow up in the tri-state area without knowing what the word mensch means. So for our listeners and um, and, and readers and um and others out there in our audience, can you, can you tell us the true definition of the word mensch? Sure. It's actually a decent, responsible person. And Pete, the origins are male, but it's, at this point, it's not a male word at all. And it applies universally across all religions and everything else. Okay, great. I have one last follow-up question, which is, as the mother of boys... Um, you know, we, not only do we want to marry a mensch, but we want to raise menches. So um, what are some tips that you provide to um, your clients and just that you can share with our audience about raising a mensch? 
Well, I don't really dig into that with clients so much because my clients are single. So uh, they might be a single parent, certainly, but they come to see me for dating purposes. But I am endeavoring to raise a man. My son is 17, and he's actually a volunteer firefighter. So I'm hugely proud of him. I can't take ownership of that choice for him, but we do support it fully. So I think part of raising a mensch is to model. And I, I didn't model being a fire person, but I did model giving back to other people, thinking about the community. What can you do for others? When he was little, we used to do really simple things like baking brownies for the local fire department and police department to thank them for their efforts. I would take him to North Shore Animal League and we would donate blankets and pillows and all kinds of things that the animals were in need of. So I think there's a lot of steps that you can do and, and kids notice how you show up in the world. And I tried to be overt about it, but even if you're not, I would just make it part of your ongoing dialogue and lead by example and don't limit it to your community because not everyone lives like you or looks like you. And that's an important lesson to share. Absolutely. That's very good advice. Lara. Hi, Robin. Hi. Well, it's great to meet you. And um, I really enjoyed reading parts of your book and I, I intend to finish it. So I just wanted to know if you could offer some advice for that's timely because right now during COVID, it's very challenging for the dating world. And there are, uh, I, I, I'd love to hear how you're coaching in terms of getting out there and having COVID safe dating experiences and, and even just to push people to, to continue dating during this time. Cause I, I could imagine it might be a time where people retreat and say, I'm just going to sit back and wait till this passes. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. And that's actually a really great question. And I, I've actually been very active as a love coach during the pandemic and I wasn't sure how it was going to go, but I'm really glad to see that. And I think it's so important not to give up during this time and not to feel like this time has to be quiet. And a number of my clients who are ongoing, but I've also started working with some new people who are recognizing that they don't want to just waste this time because we don't know how long this is going to go on. This is not a quick fix, unfortunately. But what I do see is an amazing opportunity to connect virtually. And yes, you can do the social distance thing too, but virtual connection has so much to gain because there's so much being offered now that was not really being offered before. And I'm a fan of not just doing things that are social, but also just expanding your social circle period. And that could be things like networking, that could be joining organizations, that could be seeking out even like common workspaces, for example, that are doing all kinds of online stuff. There's such a plethora, taking classes, you know, seeking out the things that you might not have done before because A, it either wasn't on your radar or now it's in such abundance that you can clearly find something. And it's, it, you might be surprised how you can actually connect during this time in a meaningful way. And I have myself, in fact, I've met some really cool people during the pandemic, all virtual. And I've actually segued from a few into a social distance backyard visit because I do live in the suburbs and I am able to do that. But certainly if you live in a city, you can do that as well safely within your comfort level. But I think just to jump in there and to recognize that it's a time that People are more sensitive. You know, people might not be completely themselves. There is a level of an emotion that's there for some that didn't really exist previously. So to be kind to yourself if you're feeling like it's difficult, if you're feeling like you can't dive into this, then give yourself a little time also. Because you talked about being an inner mensch, and we have to treat ourselves with care at this time, because from one day to the next, you might just feel like a different person. And when you feel like you're up to it, go for it. If you don't, it, it's okay to take a little break too, but stay positive even while you're doing that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that 
there are day-to-day shifts uh, depending on how people are feeling. If they're just cooped up a lot and in staying in their homes, it, it could really make a difference. And um, that's great advice. That's really good advice. Well, Robin, you and I met on Zoom, yes. right? Yes. And, and don't you find when you're talking on Zoom, I, maybe I'm the only one guilty of it, but even like right now, I could be staring at Camille and she wouldn't know. And I can like look around her background. I could really check her out, all of you, right? You can be talking to someone and then really checking someone out. So that's a good advantage. But I wanted to touch on Saturday Night Live a few weekends ago. I'm not sure if you watched it, but they showed a couple and how they are how couples are meeting now and how they're meeting on FaceTime, but then they slowly progress towards, you know, the social distance and then maybe taking a COVID test and then actually meeting. Did anyone see that? No. No. Oh, it's real. You have to look it up. It's, it's going to be the new, the new norm for how to date people, but in a way it slows it down, which is kind of cool. If you think about it, it, it really takes time to get to know the person. And it's not like a quick, let's just meet for coffee and boom, you know, you really start to get to know the person. Camille has some questions yeah. about um, raising menches. I, I want to add just one oh, thing. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Karen, because you raised a really good point. And, you know, one thing, because we're talking about mencha <laughs> here and how somebody would treat you during COVID is a sign of that. And like, for example, I have a friend who's in her early 70s who's trying to date right now. And she was supposed to socially connect with a new guy. She met him online. And a lot of people are doing like the match.coms of the world now. And he called her up before they met and said, you know what? A friend of mine was exposed to somebody with COVID. So I'm going to get tested. And I think we should delay our meeting. And I thought that was so considerate because someone else might have not thought of it or might have thought, oh, it's a long shot. It wasn't me. It was, you know, six degrees of separation kind of thing. But he didn't want to take any chance at all. So he showed up as a mensch front and center. So it's an interesting time to assess somebody's character. And that's something that when people are dating, they don't always think about character. You might think about, am I attracted to someone? Why am I attracted to someone? But what about how they show up in the world and how they would actually treat you at the end of the day? Because that's why you want a mensch. And that's why this is an important conversation to have. That's a really really good point. I didn't even, did they end up meeting? Not yet. Not yet. (laughs) Because, you know, COVID tests take a little while and then um, he got busy, but they absolutely will. And now I can tell you she's all the more excited. Because right. You know, he's a good guy. Oh, that's so it's such a nice story. Yeah. Camille Camille, you have you to can keep us on. updated. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we're invested now. <laughs> so um <laughs> me too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Love through COVID. Well, I'm curious because you mentioned earlier about your son and so on, and then being a role model to raise menches, but in a world where there's so many non menches who are being put up on a pedestal who are the main focus right now beyond politics, just in general, just that those kind of personality types aren't really supported. So how do you suggest we kind of reinforce that being a mensch and even dating menches or encouraging our husbands to be more mensch, you know, all of that in that sense, or even ourselves in that sense, when the world seems to support the more cruel, the more um, toxic masculine types Mm -hmm. for energy. I, I mean, that's a million dollar question. Um, and I think as moms and, and as just individuals in the world, those who have a mensch consciousness are always working on that. I think for me, one of the first steps is to have that mensch awareness. Are you? I mean, are you, how do you show up in the world? And, and there's so many memes now. Everyone's on Facebook and social media and be kind and be good. And I get a little tired of personally seeing those things because it's not just words, it's action. You know, what are you actually doing? Are you helping people in any other way that you can? Are you doing simple things like smiling at a stranger as you're walking down the street? I mean, being a mensch doesn't have to be a grandiose effort, but it does have to be some level of effort. You can't just say it. And as far as raising kids and and with all the news out there, and yeah, I agree with you so much of it, 
isn't always good about good people, but there are good people in the world. And if that means you have to dig a little deeper to find them, it doesn't mean they don't exist. So if you're raising a kid who's a young child, and let's say you're reading to them, you know, find the books about the positive people in the world. You know, find the books about the people who marched to their own drum and weren't afraid to be an individual and made a difference. You know, read the news about positive stories. And if you can't find one, then don't dig into the news so much. I mean, I personally try not to even watch the news that much, especially during COVID, because it's like 90% of it is negative. And that doesn't mean there isn't good, but you don't always hear those stories and they exist. So work to find them and make that a priority in your life. And you can find them on Grateful Goddesses because we interview many menches on the show. A lot of positive people actually taking actionable steps to do things. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's a good place as well. Uh, Dina has some questions about your coaching. Hi, Robin. Hey. <laughs> um, so yes, I do. I have um, a few questions. My first question is, what is your love coaching process? I work with singles of all ages and backgrounds and tend to be a little more women than men. And there is a questionnaire that somebody fills out and it's not very intense. And, but it gives me a sense of where you've been, what your efforts have been like to date, who you're looking for what you feel like you have to offer. And it's fascinating to me how sometimes in just reading something so concise like that, I can already get a strong sense of what's going on. And I do individual one-on-ones through Skype, Facebook, I mean, FaceTime rather, uh, Zoom, and of course, phone. I was doing them in person, but I'm not now during COVID. And the key, what I think I bring to it for people is to think beyond what feels familiar and to think about things that you might not have done to push the envelope a little bit, you know, get out of that comfort zone unless it's working for you. But chances are it's not if you're calling on a love coach. I also work with you to maintain accountability. And I think that's so helpful, especially at a time like this, because it's so easy to get lost in your own thoughts or to uh, feel like you're trying so hard, but are you really? I can assess someone's online effort, how they've presented themselves, the photo they're using. That's such a vital thing because often people just stick something up there. You know, they want to get it done and they want to move on. But if it's not working, why isn't it working? And why don't we take a look at that and let's see if your current efforts are in fact on the right track, but we might tweak them a little bit and see if you can attract different people and but if you need some completely new ideas then I actually will stay in touch with someone and create a plan and I send constant emails we do ongoing phone conversations and once I work with someone they're on my radar so whatever I think about them that might be interesting even as a connection to someone else I'm not a matchmaker but I have made introductions so I do endeavor to do that. But my, my overall goal, and I think what can be most helpful to people, is to just think about living fully. Because that's really what it's about for me. Because if you feel good about yourself and you're doing things that put you out there, that not just keep you busy, but hopefully at least some of them actually enrich your life. And the, match dot, the match.coms of the world aren't necessarily enriching your life, but there are other activities that you can do. So strike a balance between the effort to find someone and to fill in your life with other things that just are exciting to you because you never know where it's going to come from. And, and that's like one of my key takeaways is just be open. I've often found that when people start working with me as a love coach, the mere fact that they've booked a a consultation with me already gets the wheels turning. Already they might meet someone because they've decided they're ready. And I think that mental readiness speaks volumes. Do you find that most of your clientele are open to the constructive criticism that they may hear from you or is do sometimes there's those that back off and say, I don't like what you're saying. I'm not doing that or, What's the response? It goes both ways. I I don't think it's that they don't like it. I think you have to be ready to receive. 
And, and I wouldn't describe it so much as criticism. It's more that I try to be obviously constructive, but I want to be honest with somebody because there's no point in my sugar coating it. If there's something that I'm seeing that I really feel like they need to do differently, I'm going to put it out there and then it's up to them what they decide to do with it. But obviously I'm here to support them and to encourage them in every way that I can. So if someone shows you a picture of him and his mother, like, you know, really <laughs> close, you're like, I don't know, that's not going to really attract the right person. <laughs> That's one example, yes. And, and I've actually worked with women. I had one female client, for example, who was doing the online dating thing. And I said, okay, let me check it out. And she showed me her photos. One of them, she was wearing sunglasses. So you could, dark sunglasses. So you couldn't even see her face. And another one was such a distance that you had to like really kind of like, oh yeah, sort of like, come on. Like, honestly, that's the best that you could do. And I, and I know, as I said earlier, that it's easy. You know, people just want to snap their fingers and be done with it. Okay, so then, but let's see, is it working? I think it's so you? great that you work on the person because I always would tell my teenage kids before, you know, before they'd start to date or, you know, you have to love yourself. You have to really, you know, be confident, feel confident so that then you can attract people to you. If you go out into the world and you're like, oh, I'm not going to meet anybody, you're not going to meet anybody. But I love that, even just opening up to it. I think that applies to a lot of things in our lives. Just opening up the possibility, um, you'll meet, you'll, you'll attract all different people. Yeah. Um, we're going to switch gears now, unless anyone has any other questions regarding mentions. I just wanted to, to yes. know if there's one tip that you're giving your singles, what is that tip? That's right. <laughs> well, there's never just one tip, but, <laughs> but one of the things that feels important to me is that, and I've actually witnessed this, that you are more likely to meet a mensch when you decide you deserve one. And that can sound so obvious, but I've actually worked with people who have blatantly said to me, oh, no, I, I don't want to meet a mensch. I'm like, why is that? Oh, mensch might, mensch might not ride a motorcycle. A mensch might not be cool. I'm like, really? Like a mensch can't ride a motorcycle? Like, and a mensch can't be, you know, nice and respect you and be stimulating? Like nice doesn't mean schlep, another Yiddish word. You know, nice doesn't have to translate as boring. You know, nice doesn't have to mean that you're not going to be excited for the long run. But mensch does mean they're going to show up for you and have your back forever. And why would you not want that? And if someone says that to me, that's such a red flag. And then obviously I can sense exactly why they're single and why they've been making bad choices their entire life. And then it's up to them how they want to reframe that. I have a question. Um, you know, I would think it's uh, different to coach someone who's come out of a relationship, whether it was a marriage or just a long-term relationship with someone and is finally ready, willing, and able to meet someone new and someone who maybe has never been in a long-term relationship. Does, do you find that, that those people require different types of coaching? I'm just interested to learn how do you approach those situations? Um, and maybe it's not different at all. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, it's a little different only in that you've made choices already. You have a history. We all have a history. But if you're divorced or, or widowed or what have you, then, and if you're widowed, but you had a happy marriage, okay, that's one thing. But if you're divorced and it wasn't a great marriage, well, why isn't that? And whose idea was it to break up? What made you go for this person to begin with? Is it your pattern? And that's one thing that I, I try to look for with people is, is there a pattern here? Do you have, do you have a habit of choosing the same people, are you self-aware? Or maybe you're really not and you thought you were and that's why you chose that person and, and made that error. I think it's really important to have sometimes another set of eyes on it and that's where I can come in because we're also close to ourselves and doing something that is familiar can often feel like it's right, but familiar and right are not the same thing. 
So I would urge everyone, if you're not sure why things are turning out the way they are for you, then if you work with a love coach like me or even have a therapist or find someone else who can help sort of take the, um, take the closeness out of it for you. Because people often talk to their friends. And friends know you. You know, friends have their own vision and friends won't always say what someone else will. So that's kind of a long answer to your question, but there is commonality, but there is a difference as well. Robin, I, I wanted to touch upon the point where you said friends, often we, um, well, as singles, you would rely on your friends when you describe the, the new dating, the person you are beginning to date, or if you're, you're just trying to grab advice, I think it would be easy to lean on friends and then, as well, I believe there would be circumstances where um, parents are adding their two cents on who your mate should be. And um, I often think that, like, I really am excited about your role because it's so needed. It's really needed to have that objective perspective on someone who can actually, like, walk through the in, your interests, your character, to really let you see, because I think with friends and family adding their opinion, it can be so difficult. So, Especially uh, Jewish mothers, sorry, but I'm, yeah. one of them. I'm one of them. So it's always like that, right? Always like, is you sure that person's good for you? <laughs> but I think friends too can yes. really um, bring in some of their own baggage, possibly with um, jealousy or uh, those things. So how do you yeah. guide people to just take away the external opinions? I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's a big part of why I do what I do because I'm not that person who's so close to you. Um, and yeah, we all come to things with our own history and our own baggage. I think you have to be a little guarded perhaps in, in what you share and not just about dating, but in general, I mean, I, I've, and I don't mean to be secretive, but like I've even found that during the pandemic, for example, there, and I love my friends and I'm fortunate to have, you know, many good ones and in the process of making some new ones, which is always wonderful. But you know how certain friends tend to react to certain things. Like I might have one friend who tends to be the alarmist you know, I might have one friend who, you know, is just going to tell it like it is and be kind of in my face about something. You know, we know who our peeps are. So I think a little bit, if you're uncertain about a situation or you really want to seek out advice, you know how your friends show up for you. And are you ready to receive in the way that they're going to react to your situation or not? then don't get into that with them and you're better off speaking to a third party person. I mean, that's sometimes why some people have therapists and uh, I've had therapists in the past. And I remember I started to feel like I was putting too much on my friends and they were, I was expecting a lot from them. And sometimes, you know, our friends show up as best they can, but they can't be everything to us. I think this is actually a good time for Lara, if she doesn't mind, to talk about her mensch husband and how they <laughs> dated. She, we were talking oh. about it, the, it. It is a very funny story. Can you share, yeah. Lara? I can. So I'll share the story and I will just add that I wasn't part of this project. This, my husband <laughs> had me laughing so hard when he, he shared this story about prior dating experiences, but he said, and I, he, he was not reading relationship books or I really don't know how he came up with this, but it seems to be, it was seemed to be a great litmus test. Uh, he, he came up with this idea that he was going to take dates to the same restaurant, order the same meal. And so he could have a control study that nothing was going to change except for the woman that he was dating. So he could truly know he couldn't blame it on the atmosphere, the meal he had, et cetera, et cetera, and just truly know if this was his person. So 
uh, I just thought that was amazing. And so you passed the test. Yeah, I did pass the test. He, he said I wasn't part of that specific test, but mm -hmm. um, uh, do you give advice similar to that? Because maybe he missed his <laughs> calling. <laughs> uh, maybe I will now. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I have not today given advice like that. Does, um, does he feel like that served him? Yes. Oh, cool. He did. He did. Okay. He said, you know what? It just took out all the other um, yeah. interpretations of the evening because it was so like consistent. So I didn't make it yeah. to that exact restaurant, but I think like his dates were very similar. It wasn't like adding this fun activity that right. would like, you right. know, skew. Oh, that was fun. It, like he was just being very logical and practical yeah. and my the mentor. waiters, the waiters knew him. They, they knew yeah. they gave him winks. I thought that was hysterical. Yeah. I was going to ask about that. I would imagine that the restaurant was highly amused. You know, yeah. Yeah. His <laughs> so by the I, way, I'll yeah. just add that, that yeah. characteristic of being a very logical and organized mensch has mm -hmm. like been a key to my, my marriage of over 25 years. So he had a lot of humorous like characteristics. I so, but right off the bat, it was like he is an organized mensch, and that was good for me. Well, talking about the different kinds of menches, you do talk in your book about metrosexual mensch, TJ Maxx mensch, all of the different menches. And while reading your book. I totally can understand how it has been an inspiration for a musical. And I know that it's an early development um, and we talked a little bit about it. I can just envision all the different menches up on stage singing in their different ways. Can you tell <laughs> us, can you tell us a bit more about this development? Sure. I was actually approached by a Broadway producer a number of years ago about spinning the book into a musical. And unfortunately he passed away and so I lost my cheerleader, but then fast forward, I became involved on the producing end myself theatrically, and I became Tony nominated for Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 that was on Broadway with Josh Groban. And through my involvement with that and just digging deeper into the industry, I started mentioning it to people and other producers and colleagues and things who all thought it was just such a fun idea. So I now have a producing partner who I'm working with on it. And yes, we're in early development. And we've hired our book writer actually during the pandemic, which I, I'm so thrilled to support artists at this time and to be developing a new project at this time. And we have our composer lyricist. The book is inspiration. So I'm not sure that you're going to see those mentions on stage in the way that you're describing it. But they are writing an original story. So it's inspired by the book. It's not going to be the book theatrically put up there. But our hope with it is that the message will ring true that it takes one to know one to find one. And we're actually kind of on mission mensch. And if we can inspire more people to be a mensch, and obviously the show is not going to be preachy, it's going to be entertaining. And, but hopefully we'll have messages that will resonate and to get people to think about how am I showing up in the world? What are my efforts? What can I do differently? And am I helping to spread menschhood? And if we can put that out there, you know, my work will be done. <laughs> That's so exciting. And I'm sure it was really validating and rewarding to you, especially being a writer. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your connections to Broadway then? A little bit more about that? Sure. I'm just a longtime theater lover. And I was a theater critic in college for my student newspaper. Oh, and then I was doing freelance writing in the theater realm when I graduated. So I actually wanted to be a theater critic for a while. And but Frank Rich got hired by the New York Times. He was the lead critic back when I graduated. So I thought, oh, he took my job mm -hmm. as if there was no other job that I could get. So I kind of pushed it aside and just started doing it freelance. And then I pursued some other career work. But then I circled back to it because I was raised loving theater. I, I never thought I'd be a producer per se, but it kind of fell into place actually through my motherhood organization that I launched because there was a big trend in mom shows for a while and off Broadway, regionally, all over the place. 
And I reached out to a show that was in California about moms, not knowing it was coming to New York. And I connected with the two producers on that, and they actually invited me on. So it was the first show I got involved with as an associate producer. And I just found my peeps. You know, I found my home. My heart was in theater. It always has been. And from that, I started to get involved with Broadway. And I'm actually on two other shows, uh, Broadway shows, that are in early development. And of course, now the industry's in intermission. But it's coming back, and those shows will be done, and as well as many others. That's one amazing thing during this COVID period is the creativity is off the charts. And I recently got named to the board of New York Theater Barn, which is a nonprofit organization. And one of the things that I'd love to share just with all the theater lovers out there is that if you do really enjoy theater, and if you think of Broadway, try to have a consciousness of where those shows came from. No show just starts on Broadway. They all either started off Broadway or regionally or even overseas. And because of that, organizations like a New York Theater Barn or a Public Theater or a Moss or Ars Nova, there's so many off-Broadway nonprofits that really, really need support right now because those are the incubators for the new works that eventually make it to off-Broadway and Broadway. So if you want to see shows again in the future, take a look at the incubators now. And they're also all doing amazing virtual work right now. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can watch. But think about supporting, too. And it doesn't have to be a lot of money, but it all adds up. And it's really valued by these theatrical organizations. You mentioned motherhood. So let's turn a little bit to that. What led you to launch Motherhood Later? Can you tell us about that? Sure. I became a mom uh, over 40 with my husband through adoption, and we'd had fertility challenges. And I never thought about age, really. But when I was out there in the parenting trenches, so to speak, with my young son, and my, my dad was alive, but my mom had passed, so I didn't have that maternal support. And I didn't have a lot of friends in my circle who were doing it. They had either started younger than me or they were just single. They hadn't met somebody yet. And I really didn't know anyone who adopted. So I was in a mommy and me program and I thought, oh, this would be cool. I could meet some interesting moms here. My son was young. He could play. And so the kids are playing and the moms are off to the side. And the discussion was led by a social worker. And it got to be such a bore. Every week, it was like the same stuff being talked about. And there was one woman in the group who was like ad nauseum. Every week, she would complain her mother shopped too much for her kid. And after like the third week of hearing this, I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> then I got on a soapbox and I whipped out my business card and I handed it to her in the middle of the group. And I said, here's my card. Your mom can shop for me anytime. And you know what? If she wasn't here, you would miss her. And then I sat down, I thought, oh, that's great, Robin. You're gonna make a lot of friends doing that. And afterwards, she came over and thanked me, and I was glad that I gave her that aha moment, but it was also a big aha moment for me. And it made me think about where I was at in my life, and that maybe age did matter. And where are my peeps? You know, where are the women over 35 who are parenting? And, and I knew they existed, but I wasn't meeting them out here and I'm in the suburbs, like I said, and I was going to the parks and doing all kinds of stuff for my son and they either weren't showing up or I wasn't walking around saying, so how old are you? <laughs> you know, you don't talk to people about age. So I started looking online to see if anything existed and I was amazed to see that it actually did not. So I launched Motherhood Later just in New York and I have a background as a publicist. So I was able to get the word out very easily and we began completely offline. It was just a meeting like once a month and we would just talk. It was strictly the moms. And from the get-go, I think I had like 15 women and it kept growing from there. And then I started doing mommy and me events and then doing mom's dinners and lunches. It started growing, growing in New York. And then I reconnected with a gal who I used to be friends with in New York, and she was a big tech gal, a big like pioneer in the women's realm in that arena. And she had, unbeknownst to me, moved to Alaska and was now a later mom too. 
do? And she said, oh my God, I need that. So she launched what became our second chapter in Anchorage. And then she said to me, you know, we should really have a website. I said, sounds good to me. And she said, I'll do it. I said, great. So then she created motherhoodlater.com, which I've now had redone because that was a while back. But once we got online, we now have chapters all over the world. We just recently launched chapters in Houston and Nigeria, which has been fascinating, I have to say. And I've started doing um, with a gal who's become a partner of, my, of mine. She has our Houston chapter, and she's actually a mom who adopted as well later in life. And we're doing a free Zoom chat. We were doing it every week since like late March. I wanted to do a give back to our later mom community during the pandemic. Because it's hard for all of us, but especially for moms at this time with the whole remote learning and homeschooling. And there's so much going on with that. And now we're every other week, but it's been an amazing thing and it's free. And I've, I've really loved hearing not just about people's parenting challenges, but also about how COVID is affecting where they live. And like Nigeria has been a whole other example of that. So It's incredible. I, we're all moms here. We, we range though in age. I think Camille, you have the youngest child here. Yes. Yes. I have the middle school age. Yeah. Camille has some questions for you too. Yeah, so um, it's very interesting that you bring up about your about your fertility challenges and so on, and causing for you to have to have um, a child later in life. I too went through a lot of that and decided I wasn't going to even have children because I had so many different medical issues already, and ended up having my daughter thirty two unexpectedly. But what was your decision as far as to make that decision to become a mom later in life, like? How did you come to that choice? Um, it wasn't really a choice to become a mom later in life. It was, it started when I met my husband and I was in my thirties when I met him, but we got married and I didn't want to become a mom immediately. So we waited a couple of years before we started trying. Cause for me, it, it always felt important to know who I was as a person to feel established and um, comfortable and happy with my career choices and what I had achieved professionally because I wanted to be able to show up as a mom in the fullest possible way. And it's such a balancing act, you know, as we all know, and something has to give and we can't be good at everything and be on our game all the time. But I wanted to be in a positive place. And, but then once we decided that we were ready, we had unforeseen fertility challenges. And so we went through um, IVF, we did some inseminations, you know, we did testing, you know, to figure out what's wrong. It's quite a process as anyone knows who's been through fertility challenges. And, and my mom actually passed away during that time. So it, that might've even been part of it because stress certainly impacts fertility. So it was a really difficult time and I never really felt that comfortable with the drugs, you know, for myself on a personal level, especially with the IVF. I just felt like this might not be so healthy for my body. So while we did it, we didn't do it a gazillion times, you know, like some women choose to do and no judgment if that's your choice, but it just, it wasn't my choice or our choice, I should say. And then we started becoming open to adoption and I had never really thought that much about it. I was never against it in any way. I just wasn't really informed. And we started looking into it and eventually did that. And unfortunately had a really bad experience and we wound up getting scammed. Oh, no. And yeah. And that also contributed to my later in life mom um, status because we lost a good couple of years uh, because of the scam waiting for a child that we were never going to get. How heartbreaking. So, Oh. Yeah, that scam by an agency. Oh, no. Do and you have any red flags you can suggest for other yeah. people to avoid that same thing happening? That well, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, our, our adoption story could be a lifetime movie. It actually. sounds like one. Just, <laughs> I did not know I was delving into that. But, oh, my God. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny because I consider myself an intelligent person. Mm -hmm. I tried to do my homework. As I said earlier, I didn't know anyone else who had adopted I don't know even, I try to think back, how did we get to this agency, this particular one, and where did that come from? And I can tell you they were in California. 
Um, I don't even know how we got to them, but certainly if I knew then what I know now and having been through this experience, I would try to find others who have adopted. I would contact some adoption organizations, see if they can refer you if you are going the agency route. I mean, there are different ways to go. And we eventually got my son the private route after being scammed by the agency. I was like, okay, we're done with that. Um, but it was very complicated and we have legal matters, you know, as a result of that and financial loss, loss of time, um, you know, loss of spirit for a while. I see you and your husband were able to, you know, go through something so tough together. Like truly both of you are mentions to even go through that and still be together. Even I was going to say that you're, yeah. Pa- yeah, that's tough. Yeah. And it was a tough bounce back, you know, I'll say, yeah. because once we realized, and we found out really inadvertently through an attorney who wasn't even our attorney, um, who I had reached out to about something, and she raised this red flag, and I was like, oh my God, because we actually wound up part of a class action suit. Wow. So mm. it wasn't just us. It was a whole plan just thing. Just disgusting. Yeah. Laura, Laura, you wanted to add? Yeah, Robin, I was going to say, I really think that for those of those people watching or listening, you're a true inspiration to really putting out into the world what you needed. And at the same time, it just opened up. It's like, I just get the shivers thinking of all these people who've benefited all over the world from your, your um, inspiration. And I can relate because I had lost my mother prior to having my first baby and being in amongst women in the play groups Um, hearing of different stressors that were affecting them really was just not even in my realm of thought at the time. And I think that uh, having, I seeked out these, these um, options, but they weren't available. And I think had I, you know, followed my heart and sort of put something out into the world for a support group for moms for, for new moms who had lost their mothers, I think that would have been such a gift to the world. And yeah. now with the social media and spreading your message worldwide, it's just amazing. So I think more people should get up and do what they feel they need. And it just yeah. needs to help so many others. Well, Robin's a true mensch. Being a mensch takes work, but it, it's on my radar. <laughs> <laughs> how, how can people connect with you, whether it be for love coaching or for motherhood? Uh, my site for love coaching is lovecoach.com. And my site for motherhood later is motherhood later, L-A-T-E-R.com. And I do have two communities on Facebook for motherhood later. And one of them is private. So it's a really wonderful place to share. And there's so many heartfelt threads in there. And it's a safe place which I think is so important now. And I actually have a mensch group on uh, Facebook as well. So um, if you can't find it, I'm happy to hear from people to direct you. And And it's called Mench Lovers. Oh, adorable. When can we expect the musical, do you think, an estimate? I know with COVID, it's hard to tell. But when do you think it will be out? A couple years down the road? Yeah, I wish I knew. Um, (laughs) Well, you know, we're actually, because we're early development, we're actually not going to be that affected by COVID, which I'm so hugely grateful for. Um, And musicals take typically a minimum of two years. And frankly, that's a little low for a musical because you want it to be somewhere else first. You want to work out the kinks. And we're not sure where we'll be. Like Florida has been thrown out as a possibility. So we'll see how it evolves, but we're actually not that far away at the moment from getting our treatment from our writers, which means three songs and the sketch of the narrative. So I'm, we're waiting with bated breath and really excited to put this out in the world ultimately. We can't wait till it comes out. I wanted just to read, I loved this part in your book to end, Mensch. So this is like your summary. M, keep an open mind. E, engage in varied activities. N, act natural on a date. S, connect with your spirituality. C, be a good communicator. And H, 
maintain a sense of humor. I think that's key, the last one. Definitely have fun and enjoy the process. And thank you so much, Robin, for joining us on Grateful Goddesses. You are the true inner mensch, goddess mensch. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you all. Up next, favorite things, opening up to happiness and joy. So menches out there, we are now talking about favorite things. And these are things that we enjoy. And even if it's something that you're not sure about, look at it in a, in a different light. Look at it, how it brings you happiness, how every day different maybe rituals that you have or people that you're meeting or colors that bring you happiness. We're going to talk about that. So Lara, would you like to start today with your favorite thing? Sure. I am really, I, I, I've had a relationship with this five minute journal for about a year. And it's, uh, it's by my bed. I do it in the morning and at night. I, I'm not always consistent, but I, I truly find when I am, things in my life are going smoother. And I, I set an intention. And just by like jotting down the simplest things, um, it, it really helps me. And it starts by... Um, there's a quote that's, uh, that's shared at the top of the page. And then you fill in simply, um, I am grateful for, and you write three things. Um, what would make this day great? Three things and a daily affirmation. And, and then that's all for the morning. And then at night, it's three amazing things that happened during the day. And how could I have made this day better? And highly recommend so what are you grateful for today? I would say I'm grateful for this interaction because it's just the gift that keeps on giving, sharing information with all of you. And I can't wait to hear other favorite things because I'm sure I'll be excited to, to try them out. That sounds a lot, uh, Robin, like your social, um, what's it called? Your, not your social contract, but what you have people fill out, like their social journal, you know, how to put yourself out there and be grateful. I love that, Laura. Thank you for sharing. Camille, how about you? Okay. So I have a tendency of never saying no, always helping out and just being just anytime somebody asks me to do something, I'm like, Oh yeah. And I go way beyond. And I had met this lady a couple of years ago, just casually through LinkedIn. And the first time she met me, she was like, you need to say no more. And so she gave me this pen that says no <laughs> in all these different ways. <laughs> and it cracks me up and I keep it near my desk to remind me to say no more often. And it's a full sentence. I don't have to explain why. I don't have to give away my time, my services, whatever it may be. Because um, working in the entertainment industry, people just assume everything you do you, because you love it, you must be able to do it for free. And it's not. It's unfortunate. And I want to be able to say no more and not yes, Shonda Rhimes. I said no. So that's why. <laughs> that's amazing. You're setting boundaries. That's you're taking care of yourself. Yeah, I am. Because I was um, recently, I watched some documentary. I want to say it's Tony Robbins, where he was talking about the fact when you don't say no, it's self hatred for yourself. That you're just oh. you don't love yourself enough to create boundaries for what your time should be used, how you should be treated, how you should be loved or whatever it may be. And so just re-reminded myself. And recently I said no to a job because it didn't pay enough. And I felt so empowered that I stayed in my no and didn't just say, yeah, I'll be the cheap girl that everybody knows they can get for cheap. No, I won't. I refuse. <laughs> So, we need oh. we all need one of those we'll have to list yes. where to get that on exactly. the that. yes we'll have to list where to get that um i have no idea you don't I'll know we'll find, find out we'll find yeah, out i'll find it there's Alyssa. an app that does it too that yeah says no. okay Alyssa, what did you bring okay so i brought two products that are going to save me in these coming months one um I have horribly dry skin in the winter and this is my favorite i just refilled my favorite hand cream. It has shea butter in it and it's like amazingly thick. And um, the only thing that sort of helps me as I look down at my dry... What's it called, Alyssa? It is called La... Okay, I'm going to try it. Lacetan. 
L'Occitane. It's um, a very, you know, it's they're all over the place, and I just ordered mine online. But um, 20% shea butter and does smell like baby powder. My husband's not a fan of the smell, but <laughs> it does work, and, um, and I'm going to use it continuously even though he doesn't like it. And my other thing that I brought today is, you know, we're all suffering from um, – mask me right under our mask that we're wearing all the time and the more you wear it you know the worse and nothing stresses me out more than um bad skin <laughs> so i brought this thing my dermatologist recommended it and this is not my new york accent but it is called a zit sticker <laughs> with an a at the end <laughs> i swear that's how it's spelled <laughs> um robin you can appreciate that it's not it's <laughs> s-e-i-c-k-a um, kill, it's K-I-L-L-A, and um, anyway, they're little stickers, and you put them on, and you can put them on under your mouth, and it's like salicylic acid or whatever you're supposed to put on these things, but they're amazing, like miracle little things. You can't even see that, that it's on, and, it's, and they're great. So you feel like you're getting something on your face, and, it, and it's an amazing miracle product. My dermatologist gave those to me, and they're great. So those are my two my two saving graces now for the next few months. I love that with the uh, mask. And now I want to ask you though, Robin, about dating. I guess people have to really liven up their eyes because their face is covered, right? <laughs> good you know, glasses or good mascara or you know the eyebrows, right? It's funny that you said that because I, I mentioned earlier about a friend of mine who's in her early seventies who's trying to date who has the um, the menchie guy she's right. going to meet. And she, we had that exact conversation because she said to me, you know, my best attribute is my smile. And I said, okay. So I went with her on Etsy and we ordered the, um, not even, well, she has a shield, but also they make these clear masks and we ordered clear masks for her so that you can completely see her face and the smile. And the problem is they're not so breathable yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they're plastic. But even if she wears them when they first meet and then she does a mask switch, at least he got to see the smile and her red, her signature red lipstick. And she has so, to make sure she's not wearing a pimple zit thing. Was, yeah. 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 But after that clear mask, because I wore one um, recently with <laughs> okay. my husband's grandmother who's um, hard of hearing. And so we, she reads lips. And so we've worn these clear masks, but they're not yeah. really small and you're going to need these when you're done with <laughs> those clear masks because it really, it's not, they're not great for the skin. <laughs> Dina, how about you? Um, so I am very much a person about smells and my go-to right now for laundry. And I'm, I actually, this should be used for like washing special things, but I'm using it in like almost all of the loads of wash, it's, it's the laundress and it's their classic scent and everything smells good now. My sheets, my clothes, my house, I can't, I can't escape this. It's a dream. I love it. Where did you get it? I ordered it online. I think like maybe at um, Amazon. And what is it called again? It's, the, it's, the, it's by the laundress and it's their signature detergent. It's the classic. Okay. It's yummy. I, I love how you, you love smells. Did you, I love does it. your husband love the smells too? Like I, I heard you say, Alyssa, your husband does not love that smell, but yeah. you still wear it. You yeah. still like it, but does he love the smells, Dina? Um, he hasn't commented on this one yet. Okay. Um, but, but who cares? Did, you like it. So he did buy me <laughs> perfume and it's a smell that he loves. So I wear it and he likes it. So, okay. Before Robin goes, I'm going to bring you my one of my favorite things. Um, so when I got married, I was searching, well, I wasn't even really searching. I was up at uh, my parents' cottage in the country and I passed by a bakery and this is before my wedding. And I saw this in the window and it's a cake topper. Oops. It's a cake topper that I, I just thought it was the cutest thing. It's a little bride and groom blonde, but it was missing one thing. Can you tell what was added? A little yarmulke on top of the little oh. boy's head. Um, the, uh, the cake, the, where we purchased the cake, they made it and they put it on. So it was, you know, a uh, Jewish wedding. Um, so I haven't opened it for a very long time, but it's, it sits in our bedroom and just reminds us of that wonderful 
uh, night of our wedding. And I truly do love my husband and I do feel like he is quite the mensch and he's the Jewish mensch. <laughs> so that's one of my favorite things. Robin, how about you? Well, I discovered this artist during the pandemic on Etsy. And this is one of the pieces that she made. And what I love is, can you see what it says? Confidence has no competition. Yes. And I'm a bird person, so it gravitated to me, you know, because of this beautiful little bird. But I thought that is so true because at a time like this, we really need to support each other. And we really, it's not about competition. I mean, it never should be about competition, but especially now, as we said earlier, people are feeling different emotional things, showing up differently. So just support each other. And I've become obsessed with this artist on Etsy. And it turned out that she'd actually lost her job, like just either pre-COVID or on the cusp of COVID, and has now turned to her artwork at this time. So I've been spreading the word about her on social media. And because I'm a bird aficionado, and she doesn't just do birds, but I now have like a whole bunch of her pieces. I could open up probably a room of all her pieces because they've been little pick-me-ups for me during this whole COVID period. And it's been such a blessing. She wraps so beautifully. She puts little personal notes in there. Um, her pieces are very affordable on Etsy. Um, her did name she, is Rhonda. You, I was going to say what is her name? Her name is Rhonda McMillan. Mm -hmm. It's called The Abstract Pebble on Etsy. And, and she's a complete sweetheart. And I have gifted people these during the pandemic. She'll send a, a thank you note to them, a get well note, a birthday note. She personalizes whatever she sends out. Um, and it's a really beautiful, affordable way of lifting your spirits and the spirit of others. And it's all natural materials. It's either fused. This one is fused glass. I can show you a couple is that of a little red? Is that a little red cardinal? Um, I don't know what kind of bird it Looks is. Like it. It's kind of like a fantasy bird. Mm -hmm. This one is, they're very whimsical, four little birds kind of yeah. floating around. This one I love, and they come framed or not. Oh, and beautiful. You know, beautiful, this glass. This one is a framed one. And she uses all natural materials. So it's fused glass, it's stone, it's pieces of pottery shard. And she even does some custom work. And it's really just been a delight for me whenever one of, I've gone to town a little bit on it, but I figured, all right, I'm not buying Broadway theater tickets. <laughs> so instead I'm buying bird pictures, you know, on Etsy. But every time the box arrives, I get excited. And I also know that I'm helping support her. So it just touches my heart more ways than one. Um, and I think Etsy's really grown at this time. You know, a lot of people are, turning to that because this brick and mortar is in question in some places and people have lost jobs that they used to have. They need extra income. So it's really a blessing if you can support people on Etsy. Well, yeah. I love, I love that you're also, when you say, you know, you used to treat yourself to Broadway tickets, but now you're treating uh -huh. yourself. It's nice to treat yourself and, and to do something yes. that you love. And that's also what you mentioned in the book, take care of yourself. And um, with that, we're going to end today's show. And thank you so much for joining us on Grateful Goddesses. It was a pleasure. Thank you to everyone. And I hope it was helpful to listeners. Absolutely. Unleashed your inner goddess yet? Thanks for joining us today on Grateful Goddesses. We invite you to visit our website, www.gratefulgoddesses.com to access today's show notes as well as other helpful resources. Don't forget to leave a review. Until next time, stay strong and empowered to be a grateful goddess.